Let's start. Um, Okay. Um, so I, my plan was today, I was going to review the problem set three here. So just return that back. Um, I won't take too long, although I thought it'd still be useful for for people um, because um, you're, you did, we're going to be implementing that for um, the current program assignment. So the more you understand the banker's algorithm, you know, this resource allocation denial algorithm, how you compute a safe state or not, um, the better off you'll be. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so let's look at the problem set three a little bit, and then, and then yeah, we'll talk about the assignment three as well. So get started on it. Um, I didn't have too much to say about the, the first question on the problem set three. Um, most people had it or, or pretty close to it. Um, there is an example of a more systematic way to derive the all the, the total number of um, interleavings um, in, in the, uh, the example solution. So for example, the easiest way to do it is pick one of the two um, and then for interleaving, that means that you're going to be running something in between or before or after any of the steps of, um, um, of, of the one that you chose. Okay, so in this case, it's, it's easier to do it if you choose a PT. We've got XYZ. So that means that we can interleave. We, we can interrupt and run stuff either before X or between X and Y, or between Y and Z or after Z, right? So there's, there's the, the what, four different possible locations where we might interleave something into the sequential statements of P2, right? And if you work that out, so we've got um, we've got um, uh, VW, right? So you can start with like uh, saying both V and w, V and W, like X, Y, and Z, have to execute sequentially. So you could just have VW both be um, in what I call star one or whole one here, right? So that ends up with one interleaving VW X, Y, Z. But then, you know, W always has to come after V. So the only other possibilities, if, if you have V expecting the whole one, is to have W in two, or W in three, or W in four, right? So that there's four possible interleavings where you have V first, and then W um, in one of these places. V, W, X, Y, Z, V, X, W, Y, Z, V, X, Y, W, Z, and V, X, Y, Z, W. Right? And then, and then, there's three, if you instead choose for V to start in two, I mean, W has to come after V always, so, so W would be then in two, three, or four. So there's, there's four if V goes first in whole one, and then there's three ways if V goes into whole two, two ways if, if V goes into whole three, and then one way if V W goes. So that would just be the X, Y, Z, V, W, right? So there's actually 10 possible interleaving. It's just one systematic way to make certain that you get all of them. Um, so I did want to mention a, something about uh, parts three and four of the second question. So um, most people had uh, the first part fine. Well, not everybody, but most people. Um, so I did have a couple of people that were using the claim matrix here. So, you know, um, if you're in that boat, um, you know, make certain that you're clear about what's, what we're doing here. So, so the, 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 the available resources V is a function of the total resources um, and the current allocation. So, so you, mean you really have to be using um, the, the total resources, which we call R sometimes, and the allocation. And so if you add up the allocations for resource A um, and compare that to the total R, you know, the, the, or the, the allocations plus the available should equal the total, or, or the total minus the current allocations should equal the total. Right? So, oh, yeah, I mean, if, if people were using the maximum claim, 
um, you know, that's not relevant to this first part here. So, and, and as you can see, I mean, the maximum claim for resource A is, is much higher than the actual total number of resources, which is fine for resource allocation denial. Um, that, that's actually a problem for um, process initiation denial, which will be um, uh, um, the, the total resources don't exceed, uh, the, this claim don't, don't exceed the, the total resource we actually have in the system. Um, but for resource allocation denial, um, you can have claims that go above it. Um, it's, it's just um, for any particular individual request, we make um, uh, checks that we're not with the safe versus unsafe state is there. Um, so likewise, I mean, almost everybody, except for two or three or four people, got the need right. And for those people that had it wrong, I think everybody was doing the right thing. We just just made a arithmetic mistake or something somewhere so, or two. But, uh, but yeah, so the needs is really the maximum claim minus what you currently have allocated. So that's that's what I um, the re uh, remaining amount that I need in order to complete my task is, is the way I usually look at that. Um, All right, and then two people are still not quite getting, um, one, one of the main points on this is that, you know, you, you don't run the processes when you're checking if it's safe or not, the backers algorithm, you don't just run them once, right? So um, if initially, for the problem that was given here, P0 is not a candidate because we've got 533 available. Uh, P, P, uh, P0, for example, needs seven of A, so it can't really run. Uh, but there are a couple of processes that are candidates, P1, 3, and 4. Um, you guys will probably see these questions on, on the test next week for this unit three. Um, so you probably have to do some more of these or deadlock detection sorry, yeah, deadlock detection or deadlock avoidance, or maybe both. So, you know, so if you didn't get all of these on this one, make sure you understand these. Um, so, you know, a, a good thing to show for the banker's algorithm is at each step, which processes are candidates, maybe keep, I, I probably should fix this to also keep track of which ones have maybe been run. Um, so which one has been marked or run so far. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the example solution I gave here isn't the only one. So, so I selected P1 to run first in the example solution, but any one of P1, 3, or 4 could have run, uh, assuming that I've got that I had the list of candidates potentials um, correct. But um, so, so you could have certainly some differences here, but, but uh, we're getting back to it. So, one common misconception or mistake was just to run these, but then um, um, say that the state state was not safe because you don't go back, you know, so really at every step, what you should be doing is checking uh, the, the candidate list. Again. So, so you shouldn't be executing them sequentially. So check P1, check P0, then P1, P2, 3, P3, P4, P5, and then you're done. Right. So that's, that's kind of a common, that's, that's a common thing that some people do when you get to writing the, the, the program for the assignment three, right? So you really need a loop that keeps going as long as the function that, that checks if there's a candidate or not fits back that, that we have um, a candidate, right? So until there's no candidate, you're not really done. You should always be going, finding all the, the processes that are candidates, selecting one of the process that's a candidate, um, simulating it running to completion. Right? So that's, that's the banker's algorithm. In our, in our assignment here for um, assignment three, we, we write a function that checks to see if there's a candidate process or not, and it returns the first process that it finds as a candidate. So our loop would be a little bit different in our actual programming assignment than what I'm describing here, because it'll always return either one process, the next process, 
or the first process that it finds that there's a candidate, or it will return a flag indicating that there's no candidate. So for our programming assignment, you should have a loop that goes as long as the um, that function to select the next candidate doesn't return no candidate is available. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, I guess another kind of hint or request is it is good to also, you know, show the complete sequence and maybe even explicitly state it, you know, so at the end, uh, the state is safe because the sequence, in, in this case that I showed you in the example solution, the, the sequence P1, 2, 3, 0, 4, uh, safely runs all the processes to completion, thus the the initial state was safe um, as given. Um, if you do run all the steps, I mean, you know, kind of as a double check, you should find that your current available ends up being equal to R equals equal to the total resources at the end, because you should have run all the processes, you should have returned back all the resources, so they should all be back available. Um, and then finally for part four, a lot of people still didn't have, didn't, didn't, didn't specify, didn't get the new state created correctly. So, um, the most common thing, and again, I'm getting a lot of people look like they're working together, you guys need to be careful about that, but the most common thing was, you know, I had at least 20%, 25% of people were actually adding the value to the um, um, to the need matrix or the claim matrix instead of instead of um, doing what I should have done. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember exactly what people were doing. But, uh, but, but yeah, it came down to, you know, so, so this was supposed to be an additional resource request for process one, um, two or three people, two, two people were doing it for the wrong process somehow, like for process four or something. But, um, but given this is additional resources for process one, the effect should be whenever you're doing a banker's algorithm like this is, so you first have to figure out what the new state, proposed state is before you can declare whether it's safe or not, and then determine whether you should allow that resource allocation um, to be given um, or denied, right? Um, so if, if additional resources are requested, that means that the allocation should go up in the new proposed state um, and the needs should go down, right? The claims will never change. Um, so claims is the maximum that you claim that I would ever need in order to finish the work. Um, oh, and, and available should go down as well, because if you're allocating some additional resources, uh, those resources will become allocated, they're no longer available, right? So you should see both uh, available and allocations go down, um, or uh, allocations go up and, and available and need to go down, right? Um, all right, and then, you know, again, if you get a problem to do this on the tests, um, next week for the unit three, uh, you shouldn't stop there. So some people, some people kind of gave me a correct state, but then just gave me the um, um, kind of the, the conclusion, okay, the state is safe, but it's, you know, it's not immediately obvious that the state is safe. You, you still have to demonstrate that is safe. So we have to show the sequence of executions that allows the um, all the processes to run to completion. Right. That's how you demonstrate a state is safe in the banker's algorithm. In this case, we actually end up with the same state um, after running um, process one back on part three here, right? Because um, so basically we've come to the part where we 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 simulated exactly kind of the steps that we're doing um, for the banker's algorithm because by by the, the request that we gave was based for, for process one was a request for all of the remaining resources that it needed 
Okay, and, that, and that's what we're simulating. So, so the kind of one of the reasons why I did this part four here uh, was again to emphasize what the banker's algorithm is doing. Okay, so when you when you find candidates um, and you you select one and run to completion, what you're doing is um, you're giving it all of its resources that it needs, um, and then um, letting it run till it's finished, so that when it's finished, it can return its allocated resource, right? So, and that's exactly where we're at once we give those resources, because that was the, um, that gave process one its maximum allocations, 2233, uh, three, which was the maximum claim that it needed, okay? So by giving process one all of the resources that it claimed it needed at most, um, its needs go to zero, um, and um, and uh, and yeah, we're, we're at the same point we were uh, for the previous step. So there is actually the same set of safe sequences um, like I showed at the previous step. Um, another common mistake here was to get down to this point, to have the state correct, but then to say that no process was a candidate, which um, I can kind of see. So some people seem to only, again, uh, for this new state, we're only checking for some reason, like um, if process four was a candidate or something like that. But, so again, and in, in fact, none of these processes are candidates. So, so uh, you know, the available, once you do this is three, two, one, one. So we've only got three of A, which actually eliminates process zero, two, um, and four. None of them are candidates. We've only got two of B, um, and, and process three needs three of those. So, so process three is not a candidate. Right? But you know, process one doesn't need anything else, right? So process one is definitely a candidate. Um, it can run to completion, and that helps because you know process one on this new state has some resources allocated, and by freeing those back up, some of these other processes might be candidates. And in fact, of course, um, some of the processes are candidates. Then um, um, and, um, and, and, and yeah, you, you can find the safe sequence uh, for this fourth part here. Um, uh, so yeah, that was all I had kind of talked about on this third problem. So that was the most common things that I saw on the ones that I returned. And people. Um, so any questions about the problem set here before I move on? Um, all right, so anyway, that example is posted up there. You know, you pair it with, with your own kind of work if you want more details on those questions. So, yeah, try the remaining time. Um, let's get started on the third program assignment. See if everybody has those questions on it. I think most people will probably find this one easier than the previous one, um, um, at least a bit. If not quite a bit. So, I already got it up here. So. All right. Um, so, we're sticking um, with Banker's algorithm for the program assignment. So, we're actually going to be implementing um, the function described in. Um, textbook, um, the, the one from figure 6.9, chapter 6.9. So we're actually going to be implementing the safe function here. So we're not really doing the full resource allocation denial. We're just implementing the, um, the, 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 the check for safe or not, right? So, so we don't have anything in our simulation to have a proposed new 
allocation of resources, then to create a new state. We, we could add those that in, uh, but but we kind of skip that to just directly go to given the state S, is it safe or not? So, so that, that's all we're doing in the assignment three here. Um, So to describe this, there's, um, in order to make the task easier, uh, the assignment breaks it up into, uh, you first start by implementing three methods that are all gonna be reused, are gonna be used inside of the is safe method, right? So instead of just having you directly implement is safe, uh, we'll first implement um, these three methods for task one, two, and three called needs are met, that's that's the one that I was kind of talking about. That's the one that tests to see if um, um, any processy is a candidate. Um, or sorry, that's fine candidate, right? So fine candidate process uh, will, will test uh, given the current available, uh, whether it's a candidate process or not. Uh, it uses needs are met. So needs are met is, is simpler. It, it checks given the current available vector and given one particular process, is it true that its needs could be met by the current available or not? So that's that's what the needs are met are. So the fine candidate process is going to reuse the needs are met, but it's basically going to be a loop that loops over all the, the candidate, all the current processes that haven't been run yet. Um, and um, see if, if it can find one whose needs be met by the current available, right? Um, And then finally, um, um, the third helper function um, that's used by is safe, um, release allocated resources. So when you find a candidate, we simulate it running to completion, and then we release all of its allocated resources back to the currently available, uh, and then keep going to see if we can find another candidate, right? So the, the resource release allocated resources um, is the implementation of that, of, so of, of simulating a process running to completion, um, and then returning its resources back to the available resources so that we could check and see if other processes or candidates are happening like that. Um, and finally, the, the fourth task is to implement the is safe, um, which is, you know, again, it's basically uh, the algorithm given here in figure 6.9 with some slight modifications. I'll talk about it here in a second, but, but you know, the same idea. Um, um, so before I jump into the code, let's look at the um, RLs here for the simulations. So, um, formatted these as a plain text file. Um, and this should be understandable now after you guys worked on the written problem set. Okay, so this is really just the same information um, that we gave um, when you did the vector's algorithm by hand, okay, uh, mostly. So uh, we start off just with the number of processes and the number of resources, okay. So for example, and, and this is actually the, um, um, so our, our, our state one here is actually the example from our textbook um, that was demonstrating uh, the state was safe. Right? So it was the one uh, above, yeah, the one for figure 6.7. Um, so in that state, there was um, four processes and three resources, right? So you know, the, the next line is going to have the total resources. So that's the, our textbook sometimes called that vector R, resources or total resources. Right. So since there's three resources, you know that, that means there's nine total of resource. Uh, you should think of these as being numbered um, indexed from zero. Um, so think of this as resource zero, resource one, and resource two, uh, because that's that's how the, um, um, the the results are displayed. You know, so, so we use zero-based indexing for these problems, which might be different from our textbook. I use one, you know, indexing started at one. So, so, so think of this as resource zero, one, two, and process zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and we have four processes and three resources. 
Um, and then we also only give the, the claim and the allocation matrix because you don't need any of the others because you can derive the others like the available matrix uh, and the need matrix from just these three. So the claim matrix is, you know, again, it's going to be uh, the, the rows of the processes. So, so this is the claims for process zero is in row zero, process one is in row one. We use zero based indexing because we're going to uh, be using just regular arrays, um, which are zero based index in C um, in C++ plus plus. So that makes it easier to code in. Um, so yeah, process zero, process one, process two, process three claims. Um, and this is the current allocations at the time step that we're going to be running. See with a not safe check on the state here. Um, so yeah, again, we don't give the available because we can derive that. So you know, if we, for example, if we um, add up the um, the current allocations for resource zero, which would be the the, the zeroth column here. So there's nine currently allocated of resource zero. And there's nine total. That means that there's zero available. And there's two allocated of resource one among, out of three total. So there's one available. And there's five allocated of resource two uh, among six and one available. Likewise for the need. So, you know, the need is just the maximum claim minus the current allocation. So process zero needs two of resource zero, um, three minus one, needs two of resource one, and two of resource two. Um, So that, that's the uh, the representation. Um, um, let me open up. You'll be doing all your work in the, um, oh, you don't have to make any modifications to the header file this time, um, like you had to on the last assignment. You don't necessarily have to. I mean, you know, if it makes it easier for the way you're thinking, you know, you, you can like add in a member variable or something if you want to. Probably don't have to for assignment three you now. Um, or briefly to describe this. So, so when you load in one of those simulation files, um, um, it will um, assign the, the, the correct values to all of the to most all of these um, uh, private member variables. So the number of resources will come from the, um, um, uh, the first value here, or so the number of processes and number of resources uh, come out of the sim file. Um, so I'll side by side, maybe. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it basically it pulls all these out of here. Uh, the number of processes will come from the number of processes stated um, in our file that we read initially for input. Number of resources will come from there. So you've got those as member variables which you'll need for loops, doing things. Um, one thing to note about this is, is we use uh, two-dimensional regular C arrays to, to represent the, the claim, uh, to represent all those matrices and vectors. Um, for our state here. So these are all defined as two-dimensional matrices. We, we define, we, we dynamically, or sorry, we statically allocate these. So we actually we allocate these to hold um, 20 rows by 20 columns. If you look at the max processes up there, right? But when we load it in, so for example, if we have just four processes, we, we use the rows for the process. So, so the first index is the row number by convention here. So if there's only four processes, we're only going to be using the first four rows of the 20 rows of the claim matrix. So, so rows zero, one, two, and three. Um, likewise, you know, if, if we've only got um, three resources, we're only using the first three columns um, in our claim matrix. Right? We allocate enough room for 20, but we only use columns zero, one, and two for the, um, the resource zero, one, and two. 
that that's that's um, how we're representing all these. Okay, and and it might be helpful for you guys to look at the um, um, code, for example, um, uh, that's given for how we uh, let's say, for example, load file. So let's look at the the, the code to load. Um, load the state from the file here, because uh, the, the things that you guys have to implement for this assignment, um, you'll have to be implementing loops, you have to be writing loops that, that work pretty similar to like the, the code that happens in the, the, the um, load state function and the um, infer state information function. So just as an example to show you how this works. So, you know, I'll skip over the code above here is basically just opening up the file and making certain that it correctly got a, a file open, you know, so it found the file and was able to open it. So like, for example, here, you know, we expect the very first line, we've got some code in here that skips over comments and kind of ignore that. So the very first line that's not a comment or a blank line should have the number of processes and the number of resources. So we just pull that out of the file and save that. And so again, this is being saved to the member variable number of processes and the bear, no, member variable number of resources in our state class. Um, then we expect the next non-comment line to be our total R resource vector, right? So you notice that's just a uh, regular loop, a non-nested loop that expects the, the next uh, number of resource values to be the total resources for resource zero, resource one, resource two, right? So we just have a loop um, that, that's gonna read in first of the next line that's expected to have the total resources. And that'll go into the resource total at index zero. So you'll get nine at index zero for resource total. You'll get three at, at index one for resource total. So, so again, you can think of this as the R vector. R zero is gonna be nine, that's the total resources. Resource zero, R one is three and R two is six. Um, and then the next set of lines is expected to be the claim matrix. So after we skip over comments and blank, blank lines, um, we will um, expect a, you know, four rows by three columns set of lines here. So four lines, each line has three values on it here. Right. So the way to do, to do process things like that is you should normally use a nested loop to, to process a, a two-dimensional array here. So we're, we're going over the, the processes um, in the outer loop because uh, we want to start by reading in the claims for process zero. So we start at process zero. So, so then for process zero, we're going to be reading in the resources one by one. So each of the three values on that first line. So the resource will go from zero up to the number of resources. Um, and again, don't, don't get confused. You know, the, the rows, the first value of this, these two dimensional matrices is always the process. So rows are always by processes, um, or rows is always the first index of the two dimensional array here. Start processes is always the first index of the two dimensional array here. And then the resource number or resource index is always the second dimension. So you know, again, you're going to end up with for in the claim matrix, um, you know, the the the, the value at for, for process zero, resource zero is going to be three. That's going to end up at index row zero, column zero. Um, and then we get the allocation matrix in here, same way, same kind of code. But you know, you, you're going to have to be processing the claims and allocation matrices to do things. Um, sometimes you have to process maybe the whole matrix. Sometimes you just have to process a particular row 
a particular column of, of the matrix. Um, so for the three or four functions that you're going to be writing, you're going to be doing similar things to these loops. Um, So once we've got the, the, the total resources and the claim and the allocations in here, then we can infer the current available um, and the need matrices. We call the infer state information function, um, which assumes that these have already been read in. So it can do, for example, um, figure out the need matrix. So the need matrix is just the difference between the claim and the allocation at each. row and column or each process uh, and resource. Again, that's just a nested loop that we, that we loop over the processes on the outer loop, and loop over the resources on the inner loop in order to calculate every individual need for all the claims minus the allocated. Um, and here, you know, again, this is a little bit more complicated because to, to infer the availability, the, the available vector, um, um, that's kept in a member variable called resource available, right? So that should be the initial V vector, the initial amount of available resources of each of the resource type. But again, that's just a vector. So, you know, if we've got three resources, we're only gonna have three values in our resource available here. So here, notice the outer loop is actually looping over the columns, it's, it's looping over the resources, right? because col the, the columns is the resource. But what you need to do to, to figure out the available is you first have to sum up the current allocation using the allocation matrix. Um, so basically, for initially when resource is zero, I want to sum up all the values in column zero of the allocations. So that's what the inner loop does here. So for resource zero, it's going to sum up one plus six plus two plus zero, and it'll find out that the current allocation of resource zero is nine. Right? And then the available is going to be the resource total minus that allocation for resource zero that we just summed up. In that case, it should be nine minus nine, which we end up with zero available for resource zero. Um, all right, so I spent, I spent some time on that. Let me know if you guys have some questions, but I spent some time on that because if you understand that, everything you're going to be doing for the, the, the four functions you're implementing for this assignment is going to be the same kind of stuff. So you need to be going over the claim arrays or the allocation arrays or the um, available vector. Um, and doing things with them to make calculations, make determination. Um, okay. Um, let's let's look at. Um, the tasks then. So. The task one is, is to implement the needs are met function. So I described it briefly already. So basically needs are met. Uh, uh, it, the, this function passes in a particular process number. So a process ID and you return a Boolean result, either true or false. So given, so we pass it in, I think, um, let's look at it concretely. Um, so for the needs are met, we pass in the process ID. So for example, um, for this state, we've got processes zero, one, two, or three for four processes. So, so the process ID could be zero, one, two, or three. Um, if we have four processes like we do here. Um, and then we actually pass in current available. Okay, so um, now, now we do that for a reason. You've got the um, current available as a member variable. Um, uh, well, we've got something called resource available. So that was the initial resources that were available. So the initial B vector, right? So we pass in the current available because we're gonna be using this 
in the banker's algorithm where the current available changes as we return resources back, right? But we want to add, we want to keep the separate from the the initial amount of available resources before we start the banker's algorithm. Um, so yeah, we pass in those two things, and we have to return uh, a boolean result. So um, given so so initially our available resources for this state um, are um, what we had zero of resource one available. We took the allocations minus the total, and we had one each of resource one and two, right? Because we had two allocated of resource one, there was three total, so there's one available of resource one, and there's five here allocated and six total, so there's one also of resource two available, right? So, so given, just as an example, given that, that we've got zero, one, one available, we've got zero, of resource zero, one of one, and one of two available. If we pass that in as the current available and ask, okay, is process zero's needs met? So, so to answer that question, you have to look at um, the need matrix, um, which I don't have here, but um, if I could go ahead and um, maybe, oops. These things are um, inferred inside of our code, as I already talked about, but, but we know that, that available is going to be one, zero, one, one, like I just said. And the need, once you calculate it, is the difference between the claim minus the allocation. So um, let me just do process zero here. So um, it still needs just a two of each, right? so the, the C minus A. So basically, for example, if we ask if the needs are met for process zero, um, you're going to be looking at the need matrix. So you, you'll, you'll have that. That's part of the state, the, the class here. You've got the need matrix, uh, but you're only going to be looking at, you know, if I ask if the, the, the needs are met for process zero, you're going to be looking at um, row zero of the need matrix, because row zero is the need for process zero. Or basically, you're only going to be looking at the row that for the process identifier this past name is the first one. Right? But yeah, given that, uh, to determine if, if its needs are met or not, you need to compare the available uh, to each need one by one. And if you find any need that's greater than um, the available, then, then you have to return false, right? So in this case, and again, you've got to have a loop here that checks the resources, you know, zero, one, and two, zero up to the number of resources. You know. uh, and then say, and then check. So, so for resource zero, if, if, if the need is greater than the available, um, you return false. Actually, if the need is greater than the current available, it's passed in as a parameter, which you would immediately return false in this case because two is bigger than zero. But if, if resource zero could be met, it could be the case that resource one couldn't be met. So, so you, need, you need to have a loop. And as, as soon as you find one that can't be met, um, whose needs can't be met from the available, you return fault. But if you get through all of these and all their needs can be met, then you just want to return true, right? So for example, let's say process, let's look at process one's needs. So process one's needs, um, this is the difference between um, maximum claim for process one minus its current allocations. So, so its needs is actually zero, zero, one. And if you look at the difference between um, this row for process one and this row for process one. Now, you know, if, if we call needs are met on process one with this as our current available, zero, one, one, the, the, the answer should be true in that case, right? Because for process one, um, uh, need for resource zero um, is not greater than the available. Re need for uh, resource one is not greater than the available. The need for resource two is not greater than the available. It's equal to, but it's not greater than. So all these needs can be met from that available if that's the current amount of resources that are available. Um, Uh, 
Um, so, so I'm just going to bring up the test here just to. Um, miss anything but um, we can see how um, it's um, tested so for example we load in that state one uh, which is the, the the state that I was you know using all this time to discuss things right um, and I already I already just showed that um, the the needs for process zero should not be met if we're using this as our available vector um, whereas the needs for process actually the needs for all the other three processes are met so if we go back and finish this up, um, so our needs for process two is um, uh, 314 minus 211 gives us um, 103, right? So I'm right. So yeah, it needs can't be met. But, I mean, maybe it's only process one is needs to be met. And then the needs for process three are uh, 42 minus 002, that could be 430. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's only process one whose needs should be met initially for this, this state one that we have here. Is that what we had here? Yeah, so that, that's what we had. Um, so, if you look at the tests, um, um, we actually define uh, an array called current available, which has the that available that, that I've been talking about, 0, 1, 1, because that needs to be packed in as a parameter um, when we call the need are met, right? But here, like we're saying, so, so you should only return back true uh, that the needs are met for process one, and the needs should be, should be false if the needs are met for process zero. Two and three in state one here, right? Um, but if the current available is three to two, that changes things, right? So if the current available is this, in that case, uh, we could meet the needs for process zero and process one still, process two, but not process three, right? So now everything except process three should be a candidate, should have their needs are returning through. Um, um, here for the three through two being available, we get uh, process zero one. Um, so actually process two, I'm showing should be false. Is that wrong? Oh yeah, um, process two should be false also because it needs um, three of the last resource we talked to, and there's only two available. So, yeah. well, I process zero and one, whose needs could be met, and process two and three count for two different reasons. But yeah, that's an example where, you know, um, its needs for resource zero and resource one are fine, but it, it's not until you get to resource two that you're gonna see that the answer should be false. Needs three, there's only two available. Um, okay, so that's the needs are met. Um, so the fine candidate process then, so the signature for fine candidate process is, um, um, again, we pass in uh, um, that same array of the current available. So that, that's an, uh, an available vector, but just uh, keeping track of what's currently available instead of what was initially available for the system state. So anyway, we pass that in, um, but we pass in um, a different array for the first one, right? So the array that's being expected for the first parameter for the fine candidate process, the task two now that I've skipped over to here, um, is an array of Booleans. Okay, so this this keeps track of which processes have completed, have run. And initially, you know, when we do the full safe um, algorithm, initially all processes haven't run. 
So, so initially all processes completed are is false, right? So we're just using the array of Booleans to represent that. That's similar to what our textbook does um, in um, Uh, actually, not quite. So, if, if you look closely at the the um, pseudocode in the textbook, um, it kind of makes more sense to think of this as like a list of process identifiers. So it starts off with the the rest of the processes. I guess rest means the rest of the ones that haven't been run yet is what that's supposed to be. I don't really like the name that they gave here on the pseudocode. But but it kind of it looks to me like they're thinking of this as a list of all the processes that that haven't been run yet and then once you find a process and run it you remove it from the list okay. so, so here if process zero runs we remove that from our list of processes so now the rest of the process that haven't been run would be you know the list with zero removed that's kind of what they're doing on the pseudo um but um yeah we're using a um an array of booleans right so initially uh, these will all be false, uh, but whenever we run a process to completion and complete it, we'll, we'll mark it as being true then. So, um, and your the, the fine candidate process is supposed to be returning uh, a process ID, so so process number, right? So so for example, again, we're starting off at state one, and we already showed that the only process that was Whose needs could be met given uh, resources available 0, 1, 1 was process one. Okay. So if we call find candidate process, we expect it to return one. The process one is the first and only candidate initially that um, whose needs can be met. Right? So to implement the find candidate process, you basically have to have a loop that goes over all the process IDs. You first, you only want to check processes who have not been completed, right? So, so um, you should not be returning back as a candidate a process who's shown as completed here. So, so if it's not completed, um, so and again, these are by process number. So, you know, so if I'm looping over by process number, I'm first going to check process zero. If process zero is not completed, which is not initially, then you call the needs are met. Right. So if it's the case, if it's the case that process zero is not completed and its needs are met, given the current available, then you just return that candidate process. Right. And if you check all the processes um, and you don't find one who's not completed and whose needs are met, could be met by the available, then you should return. You should be returning the flag no candidate. Okay. So this is just defined to be like negative one. If you look in the um, state.hpp header file, I believe, you know, because the valid process IDs are start at zero, so we can use negative numbers as flags um, to indicate, uh, in this case, to indicate a failed search or, or to indicate that there's no current candidate. Um, no, no current process is, is a valid candidate uh, that might run. Next. Um, so, question about those first two. Hopefully you can see from the discussion. Um, I mean, you know, so so we're going to just these these build up the pieces so you can actually implement the uh, the full bankers algorithm, the, the, the algorithm to test if the state is safe or not using these components, using these pieces to, to answer the question, right? or to actually not to answer the question, but but yeah, to run the full simulation. You know, so find a candidate, simulate it being run, uh, return its resources back to the available. Uh, and then keep doing that until either all the processes have been run or there's no candidates left. Um, so then the third task is um, uh, to 
implement the release allocated resources to, to, the, to simulate um, simulate a process having been selected and being run. Uh, so what we're going to be doing in task four is, you know, we're going to have a completed array of booleans, and we're going to have this um, array of the current available. So what we're going to want to do is when we run a process, we want to set it to be completed. So we'll set its uh, value to be true in the completed array, and we want to return the resources that it had allocated back into its current available. So, so we want to, want to take the resources that have allocated, uh, put them into current available so that, that we can check and see if any new processes um, were candidates now with, with our increased available resources. Right? So, um, so for example, if, if, um, if we found, if, if this is our current available, Right, and if we found that that process one was a candidate process, if we call release allocated resources, um, and release allocated resources takes uh, um, a process number, so it just takes the process ID zero one two three, um, in this case, um, and it takes uh, an array of the current available as input. Right. So if the available was 011 before we call this and we're releasing process one's resources, we should add the allocated resources to process one back. Right? So, so process one had 612. Right? So we should end up with, um, so if we start with 011 and we add 612, we should end up with 623 as the current available. Releasing process one allocated resources, which is what this this first test is doing here. Right? So, so we had zero one one. We released the allocated resources uh, for process one. And now we've got sixteen. Right? So, uh, the release allocated resources takes just a process number um, and um, an array of current available again. Um, it doesn't return anything, but um, um, it returns the result by modifying the values in the array that you pass in. Right? So, so current available was 011 before we called release allocated resources, and it comes back as 623 because it's going to be modifying. It's going to be adding in the allocated resources into that array that we pass in. Um, so yeah, I mean, to implement that one, you basically have to, you have to um, iterate over all of the resources, all right? So you're gonna have a loop that just goes from zero up to the number of resources. Um, and then you're gonna be just basically adding the um, allocated resources for the particular process from the allocation array and into the back into the current available. Um, all right. And then finally, for the is safe. Um, Plus four, um, like I've already said, you're going to be reusing all of those um, functions that you implement in task one through three. Um, so, so if you implement those correctly, it becomes relatively clean, relatively straightforward to implement the um, um, the full banker's algorithm. Task four here. Um, in the, 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 so we, we called the function is safe inside of our class. So you start. You need to start off by making a copy. So, so the the uh, the member variable called resource available. That's going to have the the initially number of available resources for each uh, for each resource in the um, in the state that we're trying to check if it's safe or not. Right? 
So we really need to copy that um, into a new array because again, and, and we call that current available um, in the test. So, so you might want to use the same name, right? So current available, but it needs to be a copy of whatever the current values are in the initial resources that were available for the, that were calculated for the state for you, right? Um, um, there is actually a copy vector method in state. You could actually reuse that if you want to. Um, actually, it's not, uh, it's actually uh, just a regular function. It's not a member function. It's a copy vector if you give it to arrays, basically, with copy values from the source and the destination. Or you can just write the loop yourself. You know, no doing that. So either way, but you need to get it copied into, you need to have a local variable that has the current available resources. Um, you need to create a list of Boolean processes um, like we're shown in the test. So just have an array of Booleans. Right? You should initialize those to all be false, right? So, um, I don't think I'll have a helper function for that. So you probably will have to write a loop here um, or do something to ensure that everything is initialized to false for that array of Booleans, right? Because initially, none of the processes are, are marked or none of them are completed. All right? And then you're gonna have a, a loop um, for the is safe function, you know, which is an implementation of this. So basically, the, the loop probably should be a while loop, right? So, so because you need to keep doing that as long as find candidate process doesn't return um, no candidate, right? So while find candidate doesn't return no candidate, um, that means that you found a candidate. So you'll have the, 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 the process identifier of, of a candidate whose needs can be met from the current available. So once you find a candidate, you're going to release its allocated resources back. So that's what this line is doing in the, the pseudocode here. Um, or actually, this this is this is uh, these two lines are, are, are kind of the implementation of the find candidate process. So so if we find a candidate, um, you release this this line is releasing its allocations back to the current available. Right. And then you also need to remove it from the completed, or you have to say that it's completed. So change its status to being completed in that array of booleans, keeping track of which classes have been completed or not. Um, and then, yeah, keep doing that until find candidate returns no candidate. Okay. So another way you could do this, you could have an infinite loop, call find candidate first. Um, and if, if, if it returns no candidate, you can just break out of your infinite loop. That's another perfectly valid way to go and do that. Or if you found a candidate, you know, return the resources and mark it as being completed. Um, yeah, and then there is one final thing here. So at the end, you know that the um, state is safe or not. If um, so, the state is only safe if all of the processes were complete. Okay, so to correctly return, um, the, the result here, um, so I want the, um, the, the test here. So basically, is safe is supposed to be returning a boolean result, right? So it turns out that the state one that we give for the test is safe. So it should return true if we call it is safe um, on, you know, here we loaded state one. Um, state two is not safe, so it should return false. State three was safe, but state four was not safe. So, so, so the is safe function is actually returning the Boolean result, true or false. So to determine what you what your answer is um, is you have to go through and look through your um, 
array of completed um, uh, Boolean values, right? So if everything was completed, then you need to return true. But if you find any process that's not completed, um, and it shouldn't be possible to only have one process not completed, but, but as soon as you find one process that wasn't completed, then the answer is false. Um, the state wasn't saved. Um, all right, so questions, that's, that's, we got kind of through um, at a high level kind of all of the um, tasks here. So just like the formal and the maker zone, so when, I guess I'll look at those tests, so when everything's available, it's pretty good, uh, and then the process, Yes. So um, are we, we're looking at needs are met, right? Yeah. So, um, um, or or in general for all of these. So, for example, if the current available is three two two, the test for the needs are met. I mean, there's going to be a loop. I mean, all of these are going to have. have a, a loop or some loops for these because because you have to to check in this case you have to check the uh, resources one by one right so you know given process zero you're gonna have to, to look at the correct row in the um, the need to make right right so you're gonna have a loop that goes over resources resource zero one and two in this case where we have three resources so initially you start the loop at resource zero. Um, and you check. Um, so, so I know, like on this first function call, I'm, I'm, I'm just checking the needs for process zero. So you have to look at row zero, uh, column zero, you know, for resource zero. Right? And then my loop, um, if, if, if the needs are fine for resource zero, I have to check resource one. So that would be, you know, for process zero, that would be row zero for process zero, but the, the, the column one. Yeah, you're, you're right. So, 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 so you do have to have a loop in there and check those one by one. Okay, um, let's uh, let me um, put that out. So, for example, um, if available is 0, 1, 1, or no, let's say available is 3, 2, 2, um, and uh, we're doing process zero as, as needs uh, 1, 1, 0, 0, right? So, it's a little bit dangerous to do something like, like just treat this as an integer number if, if that's kind of what, you know, so if you, if you check if 322 is less than uh, 1, 0, 0. Um, so, um, uh, oh, I should look at the needs here. I'm sure I'm getting the right thing. Let's say, let's say that we are using the needs PPP here. I, I can make up an example here, maybe. Um, so in this case, right, um, um, the need should be met if you compare 222 to 322 because um, um, each of the needs is less than or equal to we're fine there, right? Uh, but um, uh, you know, maybe you have to compare it as greater than, for example. Uh, but um, Need was like two two one. Uh, the problem for that is that you know we're fine for resource zero, resource one, um, but um, um, two still. Um, um, we're fine for resource zero, resource one, but but not for two. So you get different answers for that. So um, you know, so in this case, um, it's not. 
So in this case, this one is greater than that one, but the answer should be that the needs are not met, right? But uh, on the other one, um, when we had uh, three, two, two, it's still greater, but here the answer is that the needs are met. That's what they were saying. I mean, you can't quite do that. Um, and there's really no way around doing these. I mean, us, us doing these as, um, as, as, as humans are, are kind of inclined, you know, so you can actually do um, in like a vectorized programming language, um, you can do things like this um, because what it would give you would be a result, a Boolean result of, um, so is, is, is available greater than uh, the mean. I guess actually it should be like greater than equal to um, now that I'm thinking about it, right? But the result wouldn't be true or false. It would be um, an array. Like, um, so it, it's true that um, uh, three is greater than equal to two. And it's true that two is greater than two, but it's false. One is greater than equal to two. Okay. So um, there are some programming languages that you can do something like this between two arrays, um, and then you can say, I want the result to be only true if everything is true. Right? Maybe, sounds like, maybe kind of what they were doing. But in general, you have to, you really have to check every resource individually. And since we don't have vectorized operations in C++, that means you have to have a loop. Kind of one by one, in some sort of iterative process. I'll be happy to look at that um, if you send me the, the reference. I'm, I'm pretty certain that you can't treat those as integers because, because you know, I don't know if my example was clear there, but, but yeah, if you just think of those as integers, the, the answer isn't right, you know, so, so um, it, it, it be, because it's, the difference is not on the first one, but on like the last one, um, um, you won't get the same answer as if you just compared those, thinking of those as integers. So, um, so, um, most likely you have to do that. You have to think of that as comparing these as two vectors where you're getting a, a vector of results um, and then but the answer to that is like some sort of a, a vectorized operation over all of the answers that I had individually for each. All right. Okay. Yep. So it's already twelve fifteen. So I'm going to go ahead and, and um, in the session there. Um, we'll go into more details on this on Thursday if people have questions on it. Um, and, uh, yep, and I'll see you guys on Thursday then.